This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by the iPrize and the Energy Innovation Hub. The iPrize is an international startup competition to build the machine economy. Go to epicenter.tv slash iPrize, that's I-P-R-I-Z-E, to learn how to join the competition. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Peran Fadman Crane. We're here today with Eric Voorhees. Eric Voorhees, probably somebody most of you will already know. He's been on the show before, and some of you may also know him from uh, Shapeshift. So he's the CEO and founder of Shapeshift, who, of course, uh, have been a sponsor of this uh, podcast a while ago, and, and they are now again. And uh, he's also known for a whole bunch of other projects that he has done in this industry. He He's he got involved in 2011. He has worked on a thing called Satoshi Dice, which once upon a time spammed the entire Bitcoin network in the view of some, or at least was responsible for most uh, for a lot of transactions. Then he worked on something called Coinapult, but instant. And now Shapeshift and, and Prism, of course, which we'll talk about uh, as well today, which is a new product they're developing uh, at Shapeshift. So thanks so much for coming on, Eric. Thank you guys for having me. I'm sure you have told this story many times, but still people will enjoy hearing about it. Can you run us through a little bit, you know, when did you originally get involved in Bitcoin? How did that happen? Um, so I, I moved to Dubai after college uh, in early 2008. And uh, while I was over there, I was um, watching the entire global financial crisis happen. And I got really interested in money and banks and central banks. And uh, I started realizing that government probably shouldn't be involved in money at all and certainly shouldn't, shouldn't be centrally planning it like some kind of um, Soviet shoemaker phenomenon. And I just I didn't really know how that would be resolved. I didn't know what kind of money could ever replace government fiat. Um, and then fast forward a couple of years, I had moved back to the U.S., joined the Free State Project up in New Hampshire, and I learned about... Bitcoin from a Facebook post and that was mid 2011 and um, I immediately realized that this was the answer to that issue it was a, a free market form of money and the world had never had that in any in any sense where it could just be transferred anywhere in the, in the world instantly so um, I fell down the rabbit hole and I stopped doing everything responsible that I had been doing and ever since then I've been involved in uh, in Bitcoin and in helping this industry to grow and with all the projects you've worked on, what's what's the common thread? Like the common thread, in some degree, is that they are somewhat simple. Uh, I'm not a technologist. I'm not an engineer. So my understanding of blockchains is very high level, and that kind of precludes lots of uh, projects that are very intricate and complicated from the uh, at, at least on the surface because I wouldn't be able to understand them anyway. So, um, and, and I guess the other thread is their services that I would want to use. So Shapeshift's uh, conception was because I wanted to buy some kind of altcoin several years ago. And I, I had Bitcoin and I, I wanted to be able to do it quickly. I didn't want to have to sign up at an exchange and wait for a few hours or approvals or my bid order to fill. I just wanted to snap my fingers and have that other coin. So I realized that, that needed to be built. Um, and yeah, I mean, in crypto, there are a thousand good ideas just kind of hanging out, waiting to be built. And so one of my, uh, one of my challenges has just been in trying to focus on specific ideas instead of letting myself get overwhelmed with all the various things that could be done. And so if there's so many uh, great ideas, what's the process by which you arrive at, you know, this is the one and not some other one? I don't think there's necessarily a, a scientific method to it. Um, sometimes it's just one of those kind of eureka things when you when you think of a concept and you get excited about it and then the next day you're excited about it and a week later you're still excited about it and eventually just to get it out of your head you have to do it. And then you know you dive in and you start figuring out some of the finance behind it and if it can actually be a viable business, what you would need to get it started, who you would work with. 
um, and if it starts passing all those checks, then it it starts to become a viable uh, a viable project to pursue. Cool. M maybe one one last question, sort of on this uh, you know, on your evolution in the early stage. So when when you think back to when you first learned about Bitcoin and started to understand the concepts and the implications, and then you know kind of projected forward. Okay, where is this all going to go? What's going to happen? What what did you get right about this, and what are some things and developments that have happened that are just you know completely surprised you? Yeah, great question. Um, so what I got right was that Bitcoin would be huge and it would start to take over the global financial system. That is absolutely happening. Um, so that's been really exciting to see. Uh, you know, Bitcoin costing a couple thousand dollars. Every major financial institution investigating this technology. Um, tens of millions of users around the world and uh, you know really just a incredible growth in the transaction count and the number of services and it's it's just um, continuing to expand which is what I hoped and what I predicted would happen. Uh, what I didn't predict was that um, money as a usage would be just one little branch of what blockchains would end up doing. Uh, I'm still most interested in the money branch. I think that's what the world needs the most is a, a form of free market money. But blockchains have now spawned all sorts of these other tokens, some of which are really fascinating, even though they're not related to money. Um, and in 2011, I didn't didn't imagine that kind of thing would ever, would ever happen. And, and certainly up until about late 2013, um, I was very much a Bitcoin maximalist, and I thought all these other digital asset coins were were stupid or distractions at best um, and I was totally wrong about that so that's something I got wrong as well it's great to see someone that has sort of the humility to be able to say you know I was wrong about this one thing and now you know I've changed my viewpoint on that after getting all this new information that's something that's not really common in this space so I applaud you for that yeah I mean I'm wrong all the time so I, I don't mind admitting it so you just um, recently raised a, a significant round. Uh, congratulations! Yes, although on that. compared to a token sale, not so significant. But yeah, I know. for I a mean, Series it's... A, <laughs> yeah, back in March we we closed our Series A. We raised uh, ten and ten point four million um, in an equity deal for Shapeshift, led by um, Early Bird and Lake Star out of Berlin, and uh, Access Venture Partners um, in the U.S. plus. Pantera, Blockchain Capital, and Digital Currency Group. So tell us a bit about uh, about that round. So th these investors, um, st are they strategic for you in any way? Uh, wh why did you choose to work with these specific investors? Uh, so there are sort of two, two groups, the, the crypto investors, you know, Blockchain Capital, Pantera, and Digital Currency Group, and then the more traditional VCs that have not really been focused in crypto. And... Um, you know, I probably spoke with at least 70 VCs, maybe 80 or 90, um, over the over the course of four or five months, and um, a lot of them really, I think, didn't understand Bitcoin very well. Especially the U.S. VCs, I was really disappointed in them. Um, the European VCs were a lot more; they had a better understanding of blockchains generally. They also had a better ability to imagine what it could be. And the U.S. VCs, and I'm generalizing, of course, but they were largely disenchanted that Bitcoin had gone through this correction after 2013 and that the Bitcoin companies hadn't just gone directly to the moon. Um, I, th I think they're sort of fair weather investors. They invest when Bitcoin is hot, uh, which is kind of silly because if you're a sophisticated financial individual or firm, that should not be the reason why you invest in something. You should invest in things because you see the fundamental value of them and you're there before the rest of the world starts buying them up. Um, but for all the sophistication that some VCs proclaim, they really are not able to, to see the potential of this technology until the price is spiking. That's interesting that you'd say that. Um, I mean, I, 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 I've seen the same thing uh, in... Uh, in this this sort of understanding of, of blockchains, as you mentioned, uh, by the by, by the um, the European VCs, and what's interesting is that although they understand it, they seem to understand it more. At least they seem to understand the the, the potential a 
lot more. Um, they have this sort of risk averse. Uh, um, they're sort of more risk averse, and so it's it's harder to get them to sign on. And we re recently raised some funds uh, at Stratum as well, and and actually we're also at DCG, and and we saw a lot of VCs that just like they understood it, they saw the vision, they 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 understood the vision, they understood the potential, but it was it was too early for them, you know, and uh, and so yeah, there's uh, there's 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 sort of a you know a difference in um, investment thesis uh, between the U.S. and and, the, and in Europe on that front. Yeah, I also think that U.S. VCs are just more frightened of regulation, understandably. Um, the U.S. is really problematic in that regard, so I can understand that U.S. VCs would be more hesitant to invest in uh, really innovative projects that push the boundaries of things, uh, which is really tragic that, that in the U.S., people are, are scared of that and projects that really provide a lot of value don't get funded because people are scared of regulations. Yeah, I, I mean, I would imagine, and, and uh, I'm curious on, on your take on this, but that a lot of VCs probably would not invest in something like Shapeshift because of, you know, the anonymity and, you know, no, uh, you know, you don't have user accounts, you can't like track people properly or really, right? So the whole, I mean, of course, you guys were the I think first or one of the first companies to say we don't do business in New York. So um, I'd imagine like around these, there are probably a lot of concerns VCs have. Yeah, um, it's it's really a shame that the environment is like that. I think when the when the internet was getting started, it did not have a similar kind of uh, environment where everyone was paranoid about regulations. Um, I think being in a, a post nine eleven world, uh, government. Agents always just have this fallback of uh, if something increases any kind of risk of anything related to terrorism, that thing must be illegal immediately. Um, and which is absurd because every useful technology can be used by any any bad person around the world. And and I feel like now um, the useful technologies have this greater burden of of moving through that regulatory morass than they had before 9/11. Um, and this is a little off topic, I suppose, but I might say that, that the terrorists kind of won, right? If all of Western society chills itself, chills its own business and its own growth um, because of this perpetual fear of the terrorists, then uh, I, I think they won. Let's talk about the, the, the product roadmap a bit. Uh, can you tell us about what is in store for Shapeshift in the next, uh, you know, in the next two years, are you looking? Is this round going to help you sort of build more products or build more stability and scalability in the existing product stack? Both. Uh, so we're trying to do, we're trying to build new products. Like Prism is our latest, and there's another one called Arbiter, which we're hoping to release later this year, but we haven't revealed many details about. Um, and then we have CoinCap, which has been sort of a side project in, until now. So we have these various projects that we're working on. And at the same time, Shapeshift itself has gone through absurd growth and just keeping it running and growing and scaling uh, is a, an immense engineering challenge on its own. So trying to balance our resources and our people and our attention and our coordination between keeping Shapeshift running and growing and then you know, kind of advancing the state of the art with some of our newer products uh, has been interesting. And with all of the growth that you that you've seen uh, recently, uh, how has how have you your infrastructure and the products been able to you know deal with that with that growth? Have you had any issues there? We've had a million issues. Yeah, we have issues every day. The things we got to take care of and fix. And some of the issues are our, our own software. Some of the issues are the blockchains themselves, and we then become like the steward and the the mechanic of the blockchain itself. And this has been true of Bitcoin, this has been true of Ethereum, this has been true of almost everything uh, that we've plugged into. They all have their different eccentricities. And we're using the, the node software for these coins on a scale that generally the developers have never used or been able to test before. So for example, Shapeshift is about 2% of all the Bitcoin transactions in the world right now. Um, and, and the number of transactions we do per day and the, the issues that causes with uh, the fees we have to pay and, and whenever um, you know, blocks start getting full, 
a thousand support tickets can immediately open up from people who didn't get their transaction processed when they thought. And on the Ethereum side, like these ICO tra transaction spikes um, have, have just been like horrible for the user experience. And, and because this industry is growing, most users are new. And this is something a, a lot of people don't realize is that the, as long as we are doing our jobs well and this industry is growing, the majority of people using this technology will be new to crypto. So there needs to be really a good focus and attention paid to taking care of those people and welcoming them in and, and understanding their issues and not dismissing them just because they're not, you know, highly technical. Yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense uh, for, for someone who's even, even for someone who is, is familiar with crypto, I think it can be frustrating uh, you know, when you're trying to invest in a token sale and you didn't buy your ether ahead of time <laughs> you're trying to get that transaction through um I had, I had a similar experience recently with something uh something like that let's take a short break to talk about the i price a competition being run by the energy innovation hub the i price is all about the machine economy the rapidly evolving relationship between humans and machines with huge technological revolutions coming like blockchain and artificial intelligence some crazy changes new developments are ahead of us like autonomous driving self-organizing supply chains dna replicating robots and so much more if you're doing work around these areas, the iPrize is your chance to do like Elon Musk and take it to the next level. It's a competition that's being run until July 28th. Startups can apply in three different categories and have a chance to win up to 250,000 euros in seed funding. Even if you just have an idea, you can apply as an individual and get a stipend, office basement in Berlin, and mentorship to grow your idea. So whether you're just mulling over a world-changing idea in your basement, have built your first prototype, or founded your company, you can participate and make it to the great finale in Berlin on September 28th. So go to epicenter.tv slash iPRIZE, that's I-P-R-I-Z-E, to learn more about the competition and how you can apply. We'd like to thank Energy and the iPRIZE for their support of Epicenter. Talk to us about uh, where where Shapeshift is, is going. Like What... Where would you like to see Shapeshift in the next two to five years? My thesis since I started Shapeshift has been that digital assets would become greater in value and quantity than all analog financial assets combined. Um, which might sound a little crazy, but, but you could have said the same thing about uh, digital communication or digital mail back a few decades ago that someday digital communication and, and emails would dwarf the quantity of uh, traditional mail and that would have sounded kind of crazy but now of course it's true and it, not only did it dwarf it but people used digital communication in all kinds of ways that didn't have uh, anything to compare it to in the analog world so i think the same now is happening in finance and you're going to have a whole world of digital assets that are vast and diverse and Shapeshift is meant to be the uh, best, fastest, safest, easiest exchange to convert any digital asset into any other. So in that future, um, Shapeshift can really be a, a massive company. And that's, that's the goal. I mean, we, we want to be processing tens of billions of dollars of trade every day uh, on Shapeshift. And um, that's the future that we're, we're building for. So you see kind of Shapeshift as this, uh, as this, you know, almost infrastructure la layer that we've seen happening to some extent too, right? When you have in, in a wallet like Jax or in other services where, you know, Shapeshift is directly integrated and it's like a, you know, a service in a way, or it's like a functionality that you can add to a product, which is kind of pervaded by Shapeshift. Yeah. And roughly 75% of our volume comes from not our website. So it comes from some partner over the API somewhere. Um, and that's another thing we expected. We think, you know, a year or two from now, that number will actually be 99%. And Shapeshift will essentially be this utility that exists in the background so that any service anywhere can allow their users to convert one asset into another just at the touch of a button. It, it should really be no harder than that. Those users shouldn't need to come to us and sign up with an account with us just in order to change one asset into another. That should be something that just happens. And Shapeshift is the, the technology that exists to allow that to happen. 
What, what's fascinating is this: you've managed to onboard all of those partners, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, but there's no there's no affiliate commission for any of these transactions that they send to you. Like this, seventy five percent of transactions going through Shapeshift out of, uh, from from these partners, uh, like they're doing it just out of wanting to have this feature in their wallet, correct? Well, they're also making a lot of money from it. Uh, we have a commission split with them, so oh, okay. some I wasn't wallets, aware of that. yeah, uh, we pay roughly, well, exactly 25 basis points on any volume sent through us. And that has become a huge payment every month to some of these wallets, and we are really their only source of revenue, or at, or at least their, their primary one. And our, our growth has actually provided a revenue model for wallets, which didn't exist really before Shapeshift. People making wallets always had like the worst of both worlds where they simultaneously were was making projects that was holding tens of millions of dollars of customer money, so security was paramount, and yet no one wanted to pay for the service. So they had to do something that was super high risk without any financial reward. And um, it's been really nice to see a uh, sustainable business model now provided to some of these wallet companies. You know, when I first learned about Shapeshift, I felt like it was a bit of a hack in some way, you know, in that you like you're plugging into these exchanges, right? And it's like you're almost providing this kind of glue between exchanges. That, okay, makes it easier, right? Because you don't have to sign up uh, and, and you know, make the account and transfer there, right? So you obviously take out friction from the process, but it's like, you you know, you're writing on the back of centralized exchanges with their order books. Do you think in the, do you see in the future that this is going to disappear and the, the back end is going to look completely different without the, this big role of centralized exchanges? Shapeshift will always just plug into whichever exchanges have high liquidity. And right now the ones with high liquidity are the traditional order book exchanges. Um, if that changes in the future and if people have more decentralized order books or something like that, Shapeshift will just plug into those uh, as well. So we're kind of, um, we, don't, we don't really care which exchanges succeed or how many there are or what their makeup is. We just plug in wherever is most liquid and we take away a bunch of friction for users. Um, that, that's, that's really like our, our point. The point of Shapeshift is to reduce a significant amount of friction from something that a lot of people in the industry have to do. And by offering that, we accelerate the entire growth of the industry by, by just removing work and time and cost from what people would otherwise be doing. Well, uh, let's talk about Prism. So can you just give a, a high level overview? What is Prism and why did you guys choose to, to launch this product? Yeah, so Prism is, um, arguably the world's first smart contract, uh, commercially available product, financial product uh, in existence. There's a million projects that are being created with smart contracts, um, but few of them, if any, are, are really released yet. And we've been working on Prism for about a year and a half. Uh, and essentially it allows someone to gain exposure to a basket or a portfolio of digital assets. So um, someone who wants a $10,000 portfolio, half of Litecoin, 25% uh, Dash, and 25% uh, Rep. Uh, they can do that with Prism very, very easily. And the key is they don't have to leave their money at an exchange. And um, the industry has continually not learned this lesson that these centralized exchanges with hundreds of millions of dollars or even billions of dollars, some, in some cases, of customer deposits are a huge risk not just to the users, but to the actual to the entire industry. And we saw what happened in, in Gox when and the whole industry was set back by a year or two because of that. Prism hopefully will help uh, pull some of that uh, usage away from centralized exchange and people can hold their funds in a way that doesn't require the trust of another party. Um, the only way to change people's behavior is to actually provide something that's easier than the, what they were using before. The reason people leave money at an exchange is because it's easier. It's easier than setting up a whole bunch of different accounts or uh, uh, node wallets. And um, so they just, they're, they're lazy or, or efficient, depending on how generous you want to be. Uh, so Prism is easier than, than using an exchange and removes the counterparty risk. That's, that's the idea. And also sort of 
adds the functionality, right, of, of having your portfolio, of being able to manage your portfolio rather than having, you know, funds at one exchange and another and another and, and, and sort of managing it yourself. Uh, this also has the feature of, uh, also has that feature. Yeah, it just, it makes something that a lot of people are doing easier. Same thing with Shapeshift. And, and who did you launch this for? Like, who's your target audience here? Target audience for current version of Prism is um, casual and moderately serious crypto investors who are uh, who want a portfolio that's you know between fifty dollars and fifty thousand dollars of digital assets and want something easy and, and quick. Um, it is not meant for like high frequency traders. It is not really meant for super active day traders. Um, it's meant for anyone who's holding a portfolio of assets over a few days to a few months to a year, that kind of thing. Um, and I, I think quite a few crypto users like fall into that, that category. They just want a safe and easy way to get exposure to this as an asset class. And one of the things that I've been thinking about sort of, you know, trying out Prism and, you know, thinking like, okay, where does this go? I mean, uh, first of all, you know, you, you can choose between different crypto assets. But I'm like, okay, what if you feel sort of bearish on crypto in general? It would be nice to sort of have fiat in there too, or gold. And then, of course, you think like, or, you know, shares of companies. And so do you see it going in that direction too? Yep, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of things to build onto Prism. And uh, the first version is just what we're using to test the technology, get people to try it out, you know, make sure it's all working properly and get the UX smooth. But there are a lot of really exciting things that we will build into Prism in future versions. So can you run us through how does Prism actually work? So it's an Ethereum smart contract, you know, what, what are the kind of mechanics behind this? First of all, the whole thing can be interacted with on the ABI layer, so Ethereum itself, without using uh, Prism's website at all. We haven't published how to do that uh, yet, but it, it, it can work that way if someone figures it out. Um, but basically, you, a normal person would go to the website, they would say, I want a, uh, a prism of you know, $1,000 worth, and I want it in this allocation, 20% of this, and 15 of that, and 10 of that. And they give it a name, they say who created it if they want, and then, um, then it tells them to send an amount of ether uh, so if they did $1,000 of PRISM, they would send in $1,000 worth of Ether, and Shapeshift will send in $1,000 of Ether as well. And, and that $2,000 worth will go into a smart contract deployed specifically for that user, uh, and that smart contract then tracks the value of the uh, components in the portfolio, tracks the prices. And then the user can close it an hour later, or a day later, or a month later, um, and if their portfolio components have risen, they will get back more ether than they put in and, and vice versa if it goes down. So basically, um, they never, the users never take delivery of the assets. That's part of the point is that they don't need to have wallets for each asset. Um, they just need an ether wallet. They send in ether as collateral. They receive ether back uh, after they've closed the portfolio. And so it, it um, just really abstracts a lot of the uh, value that someone is trying to get by acquiring the underlying assets. It makes it easier and, and safer to do. Um, and then important to this, so Shapeshift is the opposing party. We, we are the ones putting up the opposite side right now, uh, which technically means Shapeshift is going short, that same basket of assets. Um, we can hedge ourselves in a number of ways, most simply by just buying the assets ourselves, but that's all irrelevant to the user. Um, if Shapeshift heads or, hedges or not, the user's prism will perform uh, as the code tells it to, and it's already fully collateralized. In the future, because Shapeshift does not want to go short on tens of millions of dollars of prisms, uh, we will open up the other side so that users can go long or short on any basket of digital assets. And that will, that will then become the easiest way to go short on digital assets as well, which I think a lot of people would find useful. You mentioned that the smart contract is tracking the price of the assets. Can you explain how that works, how you do that? Yeah, so the smart contract listens to an oracle, and the oracle is, is a program we wrote that is another smart contract on Ethereum, and it pulls in prices from uh, various exchanges, 
it removes the outlier, it averages the remaining exchange prices, and then it pushes that price into the um, into the Oracle smart contract. Um, and then a prism will read that Oracle, and that's how it knows what prices are happening. Um, so a critic could say that Shapeshift could manipulate the, those price feeds, and that's true. Um, long term, there will be a, a large market of oracles uh, that will come to being in this industry. So long term, Prism will allow people to choose which oracles they prefer. Uh, Shapeshift will offer a default oracle or people can use other oracles if they wish. Um, but that's, uh, that's basically, we'll, we'll just follow the industry there. That's interesting. And so, at, at, at face value, it looks like a pretty, like a pretty straightforward, simple product. But when you look, when you look behind the the scenes and uh, look at the future, the potential is for potentially like a marketplace where people go can go short on uh, on uh, on crypto assets. Also, uh, a, a marketplace for for oracles. Can, can you explain sort of what do you see as the as a long-term vision for for Shapeshift as a pro, as a platform, for Shapeshift or for Prism? No, Prism. Oh, sorry, for Prism. Yeah. Um, yeah so Prism will be uh, heavily gamified, so it'll be uh, like a highly social experience. For there's a leaderboard already, and people can kind of compete and see who's who's doing well and not and not. Um, but it'll it'll be where people acquire exposure to digital assets, long or short, in a simple and easy way, and they manage their uh, their fund. Um, it'll remain relatively focused, uh, just doing that better and better, and um, that that'll become an important part of the industry, just as uh, Shapeshift, as a you know relatively simple tool itself of just converting an asset into another asset, has now become a very important part of the crypto market as well. And often to make these simple products, uh, it, it requires an immense amount of behind-the-scenes technology. Um, a good example is like Google, right? Which is just this stupid little blank web web page with a search field. Very simple. All it does is search. Uh, and yet behind Google is this vast empire of technology that they've built to continually do that one thing better and better and better and better. Um, and we, we kind of take that same, uh, that same principle that we offer a simple service that we know people like and we just work to keep making it better and better and better. Yeah, I mean, I think if one looks at Prism, it's actually the complexity of it is is very interesting, and it does get you know, very complicated very quickly. So, for example, you know, you mentioned okay, if I could take uh, the other side, right? So, if I want to go short some of these assets, but then you know, like let's say, so do I I put this ether into the same smart contract, but then what if the person rebalances and this isn't, these aren't any more the assets that I wanted to go short on, for example. Yeah, so th there's logistical challenges like that. Um, so if, if the person going long, who is the user now, wants to rebalance, but the person who went short doesn't, how do you handle that? One way you handle it is y whenever there's a change for a prism, you just invite someone else to take whatever new short position exists. And Shapeshift will always be one of the parties that can be involved, right? So if there's a prism and someone rebalances it and no other party in the market was found to take the short part, Shapeshift will just take it. And we can we can hedge ourselves and, and do it that way. Um, so there, yeah, I mean, those are, those are the kind of things that we have to work out to offer those features, but they're all overcomable. What I like about this too is you mentioned the sort of gamification aspect of it, and it's true. You, know, I, you there's a there's a leaderboard. You you can see what users' uh, portfolios are are performing better than others, and uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm I'm not like I don't like trade effects or anything like that. But is this sort of one of the first examples of uh, of um, sort of social sort of applying social networking and gamification to Asset management Not and portfolio really. management? No? In, the, in the traditional financial world, there are a number of sites that do this. Like, I think eToro, um, they were one of the pioneers in this. And, you uh, you know, there's a lot of sites where people can sh uh, claim what their portfolio is. Um, but what's cool about Prism is that because it's on smart contracts, you don't have to trust that their position is what they say it is. Uh, whatever you make a Prism as, that's the Prism. You know that the funds are... are absolutely there and you know that that person has that um that stake 
Uh, and it also, because there's no borders to it, it allows uh, any person in the world to become like a, uh, essentially a hedge fund manager and have people, so you can follow prisms, right? If you know someone who's really good at picking uh, cryptos, you can follow their portfolio and then whenever they change their allocation, it'll change yours automatically. And um, future version will have like some portion of the fee of the follower go to the leader. So what this means is that like some 15 year old kid in Africa who really knows his shit could make a prism and have a thousand people around the world following him and he could make millions of dollars uh, because he has you know immediate access to this crypto market and this is um this is I think a really exciting aspect of this technology is that it, it really just flattens the whole world anyone who takes the time to learn uh, this technology um, can rise to become you know a, a dominant figure in in the new financial order which would have been totally impossible pre blockchain yeah, no, that's a that's an excellent point. And of course, if one thinks to, you know, let's say now as shares and gold and stuff like that also being on there. And if one thinks to, you know, countries like China or others where they have a very restricted access to capital markets, but this will also be an, an amazing tool for uh, people in places like yeah. that. Yeah, think, or think about someone in, in Venezuela, right? Like they have zero way to get exposure to traditional financial markets either banking or more advanced things like equity markets. Um, future versions of prisms that allow people to put in non-crypto assets uh, would allow that person in Venezuela using nothing but his phone to get exposure to any asset around the world without asking permission of anyone um, using nothing but you know Ethereum as the underlying technology. That's, I think, immensely powerful and important. Let's talk about one important topic here as well, which is um so so for example i you know i, I set up a prism right and uh you know it's, uh, like it a lot but then i was uh, you know kind of changed my views about H Bitcoin. how's it doing so far uh, yeah good actually i was i wanted to complain to you because it's up like th almost 30 percent but because i put in one ether and it more actually the leaderboard is showing the absolute gains instead of the relative yeah so, so we've had lots higher. of uh <laughs> We've had lots of arguments internally about that, right? So currently, the way yeah. it's ranked is the absolute gain of the asset, right? So if you put in just 0 0.01 ETH, but you had 100% gain, personally, I don't think that that is as impressive as someone who staked 10 ETH and got uh, half that gain. So so right now, it's a, it's the percentage gain times the principal is how it's ranked. But we've definitely had people that said it should just be ranked by the percentage gain, and this will probably be a never-ending, uh, never-ending debate. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I guess it's. Oh, there should probably be options uh, to just show it in different ways. Yeah. But where, where I wanted to go with this, so I, I rebalanced the portfolio, and then the cost of that, just in gas, was around six dollars, and of course that kind of ties into uh, the general question here about you know ethereum uh, scalability costs of transactions on there and you know now if you mentioned already in the context of uh, shapeshift right with icos that you know like the status one just fill up the ethereum network for a day or, or, or even longer and you know you can hardly do anything so do you think it's really possible to build uh you know a consumer facing application that will have you know, even a tenth the number of users that Shapeshift has, you know, on Ethereum. Yeah, totally. Um, but these things are like a continual process of improvement, and this is true of any blockchain. They don't, they don't come into existence perfect. They come into existence as a prototype that gets built on and improved over time. And this is why it's important for blockchains to be able to have some degree of adaptability and upgradability over time. Um, Ethereum is running into a whole bunch of scaling problems, just just as Bitcoin has. They're not the exact same problems, um, and just because they both ran into it doesn't mean that uh, both technologies don't need to take it seriously. Um, but these are the challenges that the protocol developers have to have to handle, and ultimately, whichever blockchains do a better job of adapting and making things more and more efficient, those will be the ones that win business over time. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, one, one way I've been thinking about this is that, you know, if you look at Bitcoin, I think the scaling problems are mainly political. I, I think it's perfectly yeah, I possible. 
right? But then if you look at Ethereum, I, I, I think it's a much healthier community in that, you know, if, if somebody proposed like, you know, a really good way forward of scaling, I think they would actually adopt it. But it's just the scaling problem is like extremely harder and they really need to have major technical breakthroughs like sharding or proof of stake to or probably both to actually be able to scale it to, you know, to have uh, applications like Prism, all these ICOs and all these other things that people are working on really work on Ethereum. Yeah, and there will be trade-offs. And this is one reason why um, I, I left the camp of believing that there would just be one blockchain in the, in the universe that would handle everything. Is because if you have a blockchain that is maximized for efficiency in one way, that might actually decrease security in another way or usability in another way, or simplicity in another way. And um, I, I think there are going to be a number of blockchains for quite a while, maybe forever, and there will be millions of tokens on these different blockchains. And it's an immensely complex industry and an immensely complex set of systems, and everyone is uh, just experimenting in all different directions. It's a really intellectually exciting process, uh, and, you know, I, 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 I'm... Hopeful that people realize that it is a process and that this is the challenge that us in the industry face is how to make this stuff better and better and better. Um, and the reason that's important, or it, because of that, it's important that people remain civil with each other, remain productive with each other and helpful, um, because we really need a lot of people working all the time to make these uh, blockchains increasingly useful for the broader world. So one last question on Prism. You mentioned, I think, in the Ether Review podcast, and, and it's, it's come up in other conversations too, is that you can tokenize a Prism, right? So that I can basically send somebody the token and then kind of behind this, there would be a portfolio of, of assets. And that, you know, very interesting new applications could be built on Prism or you know, using some of these tokenized Prisms. What are some of the ideas you have in this direction, what kind of applications do you think would be most exciting to see? Yeah, so to, to sort of reiterate that point, um, you can make a prism, and let's say you made one that was worth $100,000 and it had the top 10 crypto assets in it. Um, you then have a smart contract on Ethereum that is as valuable as that $100,000 uh, and the, port and the um, assets within it. Someone, and Shapeshift won't do this, but someone else, anyone else, uh, could tokenize that smart contract. They could issue, let's say, a thousand tokens, each one equaling a thousandth of the right into that $100,000 basket. And those tokens now can trade around as, as liquid assets and move between people. Um, and us at Shapeshift and Prism, we can't even prevent that from happening if we wanted to, which which we don't. But that's kind of the, the cool power of this stuff. And to really blow your mind, uh, imagine if uh, since people will be able to go short, uh, you can actually create negative coins. You could tokenize a negative basket, a, a short basket, and you could have a, a token that moved around that was like a negative coin or like the antimatter. You could make like an anti-Bitcoin, which would move at the opposite uh, direction of the price of of Bitcoin. Um, and this is like the really cool kind of financial technology that's going to be normal in the future, but which we're just starting to explore now that people have figured out how to tokenize value. Um, so we're really excited to see that kind of thing get get experimented with and, and built on technologies like Prism. So you mentioned earlier that uh, there were some other products that you were working on. Uh, can you talk about some of those? Nope. Uh, we, okay. <laughs> I can say the name. We, we, our other major project is called Arbiter, and um, we're hoping to release it later this year. Although with the growth of Shapeshift, it's really kind of gone on the back burner, unfortunately. Um, but we aren't releasing any details on that yet. But we will when we can. Okay, great. Okay, so moving on to uh, to other topics. So we've covered the scalability uh, topic uh, ad nauseum, it seems, uh, over the last few months and uh, we recently uh, did an episode with uh, Jimmy Song um, talking about what is what is happening in the Bitcoin space at the moment, uh, what will likely happen in the next few weeks uh, with regards to segregated witness and all these different proposals. And so we'd like to get your thoughts on where you see sort of Bitcoin at the moment and more broadly, what are your impressions on 
uh, what's happening in the crypto space, and by that I mean specifically the up rise and the rise in, in ICOs uh, these last few months. Yeah, so with scaling, I'm a big proponent of the Segwit2x plan, not because it is perfect, not because um, it, it is uh, you know better than any theoretical alternative, but because I think it is the only viable actual option to moving Bitcoin forward. And given that it has more than 80% of the mining hash power supporting it, um, or at least indicating that they will support it, I'm I'm pretty bullish on it, and I'm I'm really excited for that to to move forward and activate. I want Segwit on Bitcoin as soon as possible. I also want a hard fork to a larger base block size uh, as soon as possible, and Segwit 2x hopefully will make those things happen. And if it does, um, it will move Bitcoin out of the trough of misery that it has been suffering in over the last greater than two years. And this summer might be really volatile because no one's quite sure if Segwit2x will activate or if UASF will happen on August 1st or, or something else. Um, so who knows what will happen in the short term. But once Bitcoin moves past this debate and actually gets Segwit and, and hopefully gets a larger base block size, the rally that I would expect to occur in Bitcoin will be unlike anything that people have ever seen before, and it will finally allow the community to get back to its important prog uh, its important progress of actually building on Bitcoin and, and making it better and uh, building cool things on it. Um, this stagnation has been really horrible for Bitcoin, uh, and I I almost don't care what plan moves past it. I just want something to happen. Um, if it doesn't, if the summer fails to find some kind of resolution to this debate, then I'm pretty bearish on Bitcoin, and I, I think it'll probably be replaced. Yeah, no, uh, I very much agree with with this uh, assessment. It's, um, I mean, it's been way too long, and, and, and Bitcoin certainly has, it's also been interesting, right, to see how it's informed a lot of new protocols, almost any new kind of blockchain that's being launched, right? Uh, whether that's uh, Cosmos or Tezos or or many others that are coming, they all have a definity. They all, you know, have governance and on-chain governance as like a high priority. I think we've seen in Bitcoin just a massive problem it causes when you know p people as users, you know, you don't feel you have any say in this. Right? It's just uh, a bunch of people who are, you know, very small number of people who are really deciding where this goes. Yeah, and some, something to point out with that is like mo most people in the Bitcoin world read uh, the Reddit R Bitcoin page, and I think that still feels kind of like the locus of the industry, like sort of the the main information hub, um, even though it's gotten totally toxic. Uh, and there are like two hundred fifty thousand subscribers to that. Um, there are like ten million users of Blockchain.info's wallet alone. There are like 10 million users of Coinbase. Um, the community is so much larger than Reddit, and people that live on Reddit don't realize this. Um, so I was in Berlin last week at a meetup, and um, Peter Smith of Blockchain asked the group how many, of, this was a like a Bitcoin crypto meetup in Berlin. He asked the group how many of them knew about Segwit2x. And I expected like 80 or 90% would raise their hands. And it was maybe like 5% even knew about it at a crypto meetup in Berlin. Um, what, that, what that means is that the community is vastly larger than most people realize. It is more diverse. And a lot of people are just using Bitcoin as an economic tool. They are not involved in the political discussion. They are not hanging out on Reddit. They are not part of all this stupid drama and all the hatred and vitriol from one person to another. And I was really inspired by that. And I was really glad to see it. Um, so I, again, I, I just am really hopeful some kind of conclusion will happen this summer and then uh, Bitcoin can get back to its important fight, which is actually taking over the world of finance. I don't want to be like the Debbie Downer in this, but I mean, I, I've got like a more nuanced, I wouldn't say pessimistic, but maybe realist view of things. And I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely hopeful that if Segret2x goes, it passes, and becomes the standard that this will 
do anything to eliminate you know this drama and these fights in the Bitcoin space. Um, I don't know what that means after Segwit 2x, or if Segwit 2x uh, gets implemented, but I don't think that Segwit 2x turns on and then like everyone's like happy, you know, just like now we're going to go take over the world of finance. You're right. But it does move, it does move the debate forward and the debate has not moved forward in over two years. And what it does is people will no longer will argue and bicker about whether SegWit should be activated because it will be active. People will no longer argue about whether a block size increase to to two megabytes uh, should happen because it will have happened or it will be locked in to happen. Um, that doesn't mean that all debates go away, and it doesn't mean that scale over the next hundred years is solved, but it does mean that we actually got through the, the clog of the last uh, last couple of years. And I think just psychologically, that will be a huge relief to the entire community. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there will be like the pressure valve will will definitely be be pressed, uh, but yeah. but. I think fundamentally, uh, as Brian pointed out, these these other blockchains have governance built in, and 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 Bitcoin will still not have governance built in. A s- small number of people will still be controlling essentially the evolution of Bitcoin and the new features that come in. The ninety five percent of people that don't know what's going on will continue to not know what's going on or have a say uh, in new features and 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 the, and the evolution of the protocol. You know, but that's going to be. I, I think we'll just we'll just be here again. You know, for the next thing, whatever it is, say like moving the forex or some other feature in the future. Maybe we'll we'll have to see. Um, but no blockchain is going to be immune from that same problem, right? You're you're always going to have like a a central group of people that are very much um, skilled and with a lot of experience in the technology that spend their time developing it and really know it well. And then you're going to have the 99% of normal users that are outside of that. That'll be true on Ethereum. That'll be true on Bitcoin. That'll be true on any other different blockchain project. Um, and so th- that's something that's that's unavoidable. But it's also okay, right? We, you don't need the 99% of normal casual users to be involved in deciding how the technology progresses. That's that's okay. I don't think you would want that even if you could have it. That's true. I, I think that's true. However, I think that in this particular type of technology, um, th- those people are, can be greatly affected by 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 decisions made by by the small number of people, and and I think that having more balance there is something that we should try to move towards. I don't I don't know how, but um, having some sort of governance, uh, at, at least some sort of governance uh, that is structured. It would be a step towards that. I don't know. It's a it's a slippery slope. When you start having structured government you, governance, you start moving toward an organization that can be compromised. Part of you know, as difficult as Bitcoin has been in making progress on this one debate, it also is showing immense resiliency to change, which is which is good and bad, right? Um, depends what the what the issue at hand is, but. Um, you have you have to be careful if you want something like a blockchain project to turn into a more traditional looking organization with a hierarchical structure and certain people who make key decisions like that's not necessarily the best way that a blockchain should exist uh, and and I don't know what the best way is either but thankfully there's not just one blockchain in the world thankfully people can experiment with this technology and, and try all different kinds of things and the world 40 years from now will ha- will have the benefit of of all that learning that we dealt and suffered through right now it just occurred to me that i'm speaking to a libertarian so <laughs> i was just reminded of that <laughs> but yeah it's um i mean personally i i'm i'm like you eric i'm super excited about the the just the financial use case of you know money uh, you know decentralized money and payments and things like that but the other main thing with blockchains that i'm most excited about is the idea of basically new forms of organization, of decentralized forms of organizations and decision-making. So I think that's going to be one of the most exciting areas to see. And I think uh, if you... Well, token able- sales are, are yeah. a really yeah. good prototype of that, right? Um, Absolutely, yeah. 
Yeah, token sales are this incredible phenomenon. I mean, they're they're in a mega bubble. They're mega frothy. A bunch of them are going to just fail and go to zero. And that's okay. Like most startups fail and go to zero. But the model of token sales is absolutely worthy of people um, experimenting with. And I think a lot of funding of projects, both for-profit and normal organizations in the future, are going to be done through token sales. And then you get a very different dynamic of how things work today, where money comes from a small group of people, like in a VC, and instead you have millions or hundreds of thousands of users that all participated in something, and, and the, the governance of that organization will look very different. Um, so that, that'll be pretty cool to see as well. Yeah, I agree. And I think the implications, I mean, governance, but even more than the governance, right? You have to build different kinds of products because this token has to be at the center of it. So I think it will just completely change the way uh, startups are structured, uh, owned, organized, funded, it will really create organizations of a, of a shape that I don't think we can even imagine today. Yeah, I've, and one prediction I will make is that traditional equity markets are going to go away. Like right now, the world has these sort of jurisdictional based equity markets like the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. And um, they're very much geographic. You can't necessarily access them from anywhere in the world. Um, and they have a very you know, st strict set of rules and who can participate. And there's just an immense amount of friction in actually doing an IPO in these markets. With tokens, you're actually going to discover companies don't IPO; they they do a token sale, uh, and that is the f that is the final liquidity event, um, and that's that's what trades around the world is the token, whether it's equity token or an or an app coin that's not equity is, is uh, depending on the project. But um, I think this traditional model of uh, these jurisdictional markets is going to go away. Um, people all over the world will trade tokens on international markets that have no borders at all. That's one of the things that I think blockchains absolutely guarantee are inevitable. Cool. That's an exciting, uh, exciting picture. Unless you're someone who wants to enforce borders. <laughs> yeah. Well, probably not most listeners uh, or people in the industry. So if you look at the, the industry today, people working on blockchain, Bitcoin, Ethereum related things, do you think there's something that people would just get wrong and that you know you, you, you feel very strongly about that most people don't have on the radar or disagree with you on? I, th I think there seems to be this like sentiment that if a project fails, that it was never worth trying in the first place. And that if um, if a t if a company like does a token and issues a token, and a million people invest and millions of dollars are raised, and it fails, they see there seems to be this idea that it should have never happened, that those people got ripped off, that it was a scam necessarily simply because it failed, uh, and I think that's a really bad way of looking at it. I think most experiments fail, most new projects fail, uh, and people should be allowed to fail without it being like some some sort of horrible thing. Um, and that means that people investing in projects should expect most projects to fail. They should expect the token they buy to go to zero. Um, instead of you know assuming that just because a token is issued that the, the project is valid. And I think it takes a little bit of personal responsibility and um, willingness to willingness to let things decay and be rebuilt. Uh, many people are not comfortable with that, but I think it's an important part of any healthy market. So Eric, today you're working, you know, you have Shapeshift and then Prism and a bunch of kind of projects that came out of this. But, you know, let's, let's uh, if, if you kind of would put yourself into position, you know, if, if you were where you were in 2011, you know, you're just kind of starting in this uh, industry and in, in this um, area, what would, you, what would you do? What would you focus on? If I knew everything I know now? No, no, I, I meant today, you know, like, you know, or somebody like you, if they came to you and asked, like, well, what ah. should I do? What kind of area would you work on? I mean, because you, you have kind of your legacy and your history and your company and your commitments, right? So you maybe don't have the same kind of freedom to just look at everything and make a decision based on that. Probably the most important lesson is that ideas are worth almost nothing and that it's all about execution every single time. And what that means is that people spend way too much time like looking for the next big idea and not enough time like 
training themselves and working with others on how to execute something. Much much better to have a mediocre idea and execute well than to have an amazing idea and, and not execute. Uh, and this is something that I've I've sort of learned over my career in, in Bitcoin. Um, so that would be lesson lesson number one. And lesson number two would be don't expect to figure out what you should do right away. Like I, I spent a good six or nine months bef uh, after I learned about Bitcoin before I was doing anything that that was you know commercial um, before I joined uh, BitInstant or, or started Satoshi Dice. Um, and it just it takes time to really learn an ecosystem to learn who the people are to learn what projects are happening. Um, so just spend a lot of time like learning this stuff. Meet people, go to conferences, not because you want to strike a deal with someone, but because you want to learn and just absorb. Spend a long time absorbing this stuff, and then the right path will probably present itself. And then it'll be wrong, and you'll fail, and you have to go do that again. And if you do that 10 times, something magical will happen. Cool. Well, that's a wonderful note to end on. So thanks so much for coming on, Eric. It was a, it was a great pleasure talking with you. Yeah, thanks, guys. It was fun. Of course, thanks again for our listeners as well for tuning in. We're going to have links to, to Prism, to Shapeshift, uh, and to some other resources if people want to dive more deeply or try out some of the products. Uh, and yeah, with that, we're at the end of our episode. So thanks so much for listening. We're going to be back next week with another episode. And if you want to support the show, then uh, one valuable thing you can do is you can leave a review on iTunes or some other platform you listen to the show. And then, of course, you can also send us a tip in uh, Bitcoin and Ether. So thanks so much. We look forward to being back next week. Too.